All right, so for this discussion, we're going to be talking about uh, stress, what it actually is, uh, what causes it, what it looks like, uh, and the impact it has on your body. Well, what, first of all, what it's for, and then, of course, that impact it has, positive and negative. Uh, and then also we're going to talk uh, briefly about how one can go about coping with it, uh, as well as how one can go about, um, or at least find out how one can be more uh, resilient against the possibility of, of being overcome by anxiety or stress. Okay, so first of all, the, the term itself, stress, is referring to, um, actually, the, uh, it's your body's physiological response, response to an environmental stressor. Uh, so if something happens, or maybe you have a thought, uh, it's generally environmental, but it can definitely be something that's psychological in, in your own head. Um, something happens or you're afraid of something happening, uh, and that's going to cause a physiological response in you. Now, the stressor is the thing that caused the stimulus, uh, or stimuli if it's multiple. Uh, that's what caused you to get that physiological stress response. So that's the thing that happened, uh, or the thing you thought of that you found to be either threatening, so a stressor, uh, some sort of uh, stimulus uh, or stimuli, if it's multiple, that um, is perceived as threatening to your uh, livelihood, existence, uh, or, or well being. Seen as threatening, um, a challenge, uh, or some form of, of barrier or, or obstacle. It could be physical or it could be a psychological barrier. That's essentially what a stressor is. So examples of stressors could be, let's go with the threatening. Uh, an obvious stressor, stressor example for threatening, uh, threatening. Uh, could be a, uh, if you're walking around and you come across a lion or a bear, that is definitely a, a threat to your life. Uh, or perhaps a, a, you're going to walk around at night and you're going down a dark alley, I don't want anybody to be doing that, but you see somebody who looks like they might be threatening, so a, a, a stranger, depending on the scenario. Obviously, a, a stranger in a crowd at a mall that's just walking by isn't the same as, you know, a stranger when you're out at night, uh, off in some isolated part, uh, and they're, like, concealing their identity and they're looking uh, like they're behaving suspiciously. Th those are two different things, but uh, you have to sort of um, uh, gauge that and, and appraise that, which we'll talk about here in a second. Uh, so threatening, challenging, uh, some sort of a hurdle to overcome, I guess you would say. Um, it could potentially be threatening, but any sort of thing that um, is going to be in your way that might jeopardize the thing that you want. So, um, you know, uh, a major test. Obviously, uh, it could be threatening, I suppose, but it's not going to end your life if you don't pass the test. But it's definitely a challenge. It's something that's in the way of your goal that's going to... Uh, um, cause you to be concerned about it, uh, be anxious about it. That's what anxiety is when you're worried about something. And that's largely what stress is too. Uh, they're, they're, they, come in, they come together because when you're anxious about something that causes uh, a stress response, which is uh, what we'll get to shortly. So again, the anxiety uh, is you being anxious or worrying about this, this future uh, event or, or something that could happen to you. Uh, so a test could be an example, something you see as a challenge. That's definitely uh, a stressor. So immediately threatening to your well-being or, or life uh, could be a challenge that you have to overcome that's, that's some sort of obstacle, uh, or it could be some sort of physical or mental barrier, right? So something you uh, uh, don't believe you can overcome. Um, you, uh, so that would be a psychological barrier, like, oh, I can't do it. Uh, I can't get it done. I'm, I'm not smart enough or I'm not quack, quack enough. I'm not quick enough, whatever it might be. That'd be a barrier, or it could be a physical barrier too, potentially, like, I don't think I can become this strong or lift this weight or jump this higher or this faster, whatever it might be. Uh, so some sort of um, uh, uh, hurdle, mental or physical. You feel you cannot overcome. The vast majority of stressors, though, are pretty much defined by uh, uh, these two features. They are either uh, unpredictable or unknown, unknown slash unpredictable. So that's, uh, that, that could be a threat or it could be a challenge or a barrier you don't, you don't know because uh, you, you know the situation, what's going on or what to do, uh, or it is something that is actually directly a, a threat, perceived as a threat. Perceived. Uh, but 
it can make errors. Like for example, um, when you see a lion or a bear, you have an actual stress response, which we'll talk about shortly. And your body's actually responding to this like threat uh, to your life. So you'll get that what's called a fight or flight response, that surge of energy and attention um, that would enable you to either fight for your life or, or run more quickly. Uh, but your brain doesn't know the difference between a, a genuine threat and a perceived threat. So if I go up to give a speech in front of a bunch of people uh, and I'm not like I'm saying I'm introverted or I'm just you know nervous about having to speak in front of people and I go up here, uh, you might get a stress response because your brain perceives it as a threat uh, because you uh, have this anxiety about the issue, even if it's not a threat to your life uh, and your body responds to it as if it is. Uh, and that actually can uh, make it more difficult because your body will divert resources and attention uh, to the fight or flight response and uh, you'll lose a lot of the uh, focus and uh, memory ability that you have uh, through your uh, prefrontal cortex and, uh, and your hippocampus. Which is why, by the way, when you come up to give a presentation and you are nervous and you do get a stress response for having to do a public speech or presentation, that's why you're much more likely to forget what you're talking about or panic or freeze up and, uh, and all that is because you're actually experiencing this uh, stress response. So that's what stress is. Uh, physiological response and internally uh, to um, a stressor. And that stressor can be considered a, a threat, uh, something that's challenging, or some sort of physical or psychological barrier. Uh, regardless, they're almost always going to deal with some form of unknown uh, that makes you feel uncomfortable or unsettled uh, or something that's perceivably threatening. But again, the mechanisms of your brain that respond to this largely um, can be disconnected from your prefrontal cortex uh, depending on the situation uh, or your experience, uh, and that can cause you to assess things improperly as uh, an actual threat when it's not really a threat to your life. Uh, by the way, that uh, conjunction is actually from our emotions uh, course that we talked about because these are actually part of um, uh, Ledoux's Ledoux's um, Ledoux's uh, theories on how fear and the stress response are, are defensive uh, mechanisms that we've, been, we've inherited evolutionarily uh, theories. So again, uh, this is related to uh, uh, stress is a, uh, uh, a defensive response uh, set of circuits. But uh, the issue is that, that he connected or found was there's a subcortical route and a cortical route, which, which is... Uh, essentially saying your prefrontal cortex has a pathway to your amygdala, which is where a lot of this is generated. Uh, and then your, um, uh, there's an also a, a, a limbic subcortical route directly to that amygdala as well. So we actually have some conscious connection to our fears. Uh, and that goes hand in hand with uh, some earlier uh, theories from uh, uh, Richard Lazarus uh, and his appraisal theory. So these two are actually intertwined. So, uh, Ledoux is going to point, point out that, again, there's two pathways to your amygdala which generate this fear and uh, stress response. So to some degree, your conscious awareness of the situation can dictate how you respond to it. Uh, so if we're not properly managing that, uh, if we're not properly appraising the uh, scenario, then um, we're not going to react appropriately to that. And that's how you get people that have um, anxiety disorders when they're so worried or gripped um, in fear over this, this stressor, right? Something they consider threatening or challenging, uh, but they are incorrectly perceiving it as an actual threat to their well-being or life. At least it feels that way to them. And then they're gripped by this, this endless uh, stress response and stress cycle, uh, what we'll get to. But uh, don't forget to uh, link those two because uh, Lido, of course, points out that this is a defensive mechanism that we've inherited evolutionarily, uh, but critically, the amygdala, which, which a lot of the centers around it, it's a critical component in this stress response, uh, has a prefrontal cortex conscious cortical connection pathway as well as the subcortical uh, pathway too. So you actually have some conscious say and awareness in uh, your, your fears and anxieties, which is why, by the way, uh, con exposure therapy can work or uh, you can uh, appraise things differently by, by seeing them differently and, and perceiving them differently as non-threats or or through exposure therapy, like we mentioned, uh, realizing they're not threats, you can actually appraise the scenario differently. And that high, uh, that um, that high high route, the high road, the uh, prefrontal cortex connection to your amygdala, 
uh, that can uh, sort of put the brakes on your anxiety and gradually make it better. So these two are pretty critical theories as far as understanding how we get the stress response and how we have anxiety uh, orders and disorders and, and issues and how uh, you can actually treat them to some extent uh, through uh, cognitive therapy where you're appraising the, re reassessing the threats that you perceive as threatening uh, and then that's possible through this uh, connection to your, your prefrontal cortex uh, between your amygdala. But anyways, that's what, what's going to occur. So when, and I've already kind of mentioned this, when you have that stressor appear and it's, let's say it's a genuine threat, uh, let's say it's not, you're not appraising it incorrectly, you're not perceiving it uh, as a threat, you know, it's not, let's say it actually is, let's say it's an actual lion. Uh, and it's not a lion in a cage either, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, not, what's the word, a feral lion, you know, a, a wild lion, not contained, and you don't have protection. So uh, it's a legit threat. Uh, what the stress response is going to do is uh, it's going to tap into your body's um, evolutionary defensive mechanism, which again is a Ledoux point. Uh, so the stressor is going to cause that physiological response, uh, initiates physiological response. And there's actually, it's actually a two-part response here. And, and again, this actually goes back even to uh, uh, the, the Ken and Bard theory, uh, as well as the uh, James Lange theory, where they, uh, they connect your physiological arousal to emotions, uh, as well as uh, your, um, uh, your hypothalamic uh, uh, structures and their contributions to uh, these uh, emotional responses. So fear is a big one obviously, when we talk about a lot, the most, um, and it's most clearly evolutionary linked. Um, so there's two components to this stress response. So you see the threat, and you have a physiological response, and it comes in kind of two ways. Uh, one is through your autonomic nervous system. And if you remember back to unit two, uh, this is the one that controls your involuntary um, actions. So like your heartbeat, your breathing, etc. cetera. Uh, you can obviously consciously stop your breathing process, but your organs are operating without your uh, consent, essentially, or knowledge, uh, like my heart. I can't stop my heart consciously, thankfully. Um, so autonomic nervous system is going to uh, um, activate, uh, and specifically, it's going to activate uh, through the sympathetic, sympathetic nervous system. So I'm going to experience heightened uh, um, phenomena in my, uh, physiologically in my nervous system. So heightened uh, heart rate, uh, blood pressure, breathing, uh, all of those things are going to be alerted uh, as these uh, neurotransmitters are released and um, these neurons are activating my uh, response. This is where you get the fight or flight. Fight or flight response. Uh, and this is like uh, someone just injects you with some epinephrine. It's a similar uh, scenario. So you'll, if you're actually in a situation where you're not threatened and you get this, you'll be, you'll be shaky. Uh, you'll feel like your, your breathing will, will pick up. Your, your heart rate will pick up. You'll, you'll start to sweat uh, because your, your body's using a lot of energy and diverting it to uh, the uh, muscle groups that you're going to use to either fight for your life or, or run. Uh, okay, so that's number one. And then number two, uh, you're going to have another response uh, that's a little more delayed because it's, this is the neural uh, pathways. This is a more uh, uh, endocrinic, uh, it's an endocrine pathway, so it's a little slower, but it's still quick enough. Um, this is going to be uh, the, uh, it's called the HPA axis. So that's going to be your hypothalamic pituitary, pituitary uh, adrenal. Uh, I don't think it's adrenal, but it definitely has to do with your adrenaline, uh, or HPA, is going to respond uh, through the endocrine system uh, by uh, arousing you hormonally uh, through mostly uh, what are called uh, glucocorticoids. And the most common one that's going to be present uh, at the resistance stage, which we'll get to, uh, is uh, cortisol is the most important one, or the most common one. And that's what keeps your body at a heightened state. So this is the instant response. This is the slightly more delayed response, but the one that tries to maintain that, uh, that, that stage. Okay, so um, this is how your body responds to that threat. And obviously the point is to either run from it or 
or, or fight it, and uh, or into the backwards, fight it or run from it. Uh, and that's to save your life. And this was, a, of course, an important evolutionary mechanism, uh, which has been pointed out before by evolutionary psychologists, including uh, Lido. Uh, and, um, but, but we do have that, that connection that can, that can appraise it um, as, as per the theories of, of Lazarus and then also uh, Lido himself. So that's your basic response. So the way we're, we're, we actually classify this is um, this is from the work, this book going back to the 1930s. So Lazarus and Lido are like recent uh, by comparison, whether it was the 70s, the 90s, they were, were putting out their, their, their theories, or the 2000s even. Uh, but um, a medical practitioner by the name of Hans Sale is uh, going to propose the theory known as general adaptation uh, syndrome or theory or the system, however you want to phrase it. Um, we'll put our system. Syndrome implies that uh, you're stuck in this cycle, uh, but we'll just call it system for now. Uh, the theory, essentially, like how it works. This is how the theory uh, works, essentially. Uh, just know that if you're suffering from the, the exhaustive part of the syndrome, that means it's happening over and over, uh, which we'll get to. So first, you have the stressor, right? You get the autonomic, autonomic response, uh, and that's gonna be the uh, alarm stage. Uh, it's actually technically like too many stages. One's technically the shock stage. You don't necessarily need to know this. Uh, where your body actually is taken back and you actually have a drop in blood pressure and you're actually, uh, for a split second, or not even a split second, a couple moments, you're actually not well prepared to assess it because your body has to uh, see it and look at it and determine if it's actually a, a threat. And then very quickly, uh, because again, this is a largely regulated by your emotions, um, your, uh, your body's gonna assess it and then actually respond to that threat. So you have that shock stage where you're clueless for a brief moment, uh, and then you have the anti-shock stage uh, where uh, your body goes, there's the threat, and then it, it, it initiates that fight or flight response. So you get the initial stages here of that fight or flight. And again, we're talking mostly autonomic here. And that's the quickest because uh, that's your nervous system. Uh, neurotransmitters are much quicker than um, your endocrine system through, your, through the hormones in your bloodstream. But those hormones are gonna be activated here um, and they're gonna be much more active in the second stage here known as the resistance stage. Resist stage. Um, during this resistance stage, you're gonna have this, of course, autonomic spike, but that's very, very temporary uh, in, uh, in its duration. Uh, what your body's gonna try to do, especially if the threat's not dealt with quickly, um, is your body's gonna continue to, to maintain that heightened state. And that's where the uh, uh, HPA axis, axis comes in, uh, where it's trying to maintain that arousal hormonally, uh, mostly through uh, cortisol. So you're gonna have that, um, uh, how can I phrase this? Your body attempts to, attempts to uh, address threat or the stress or whatever it actually is uh, by maintaining elevated state via uh, cortisol. Not just cortisol, but that, that's a good uh, uh, glucocorticoid to, to reference as far as a stress hormone. So that does make you more alert and does make keep your body at a heightened state uh, throughout. The only problem though is if you don't resolve the, the issue and deal with the stressor or, or appraise it and realize it's not actually a stressor or whatever it is, then it becomes a problem because if you keep this up, so you get initial shock, that autonomic response, you get going, uh, the breathing and the blood pressure and all of that, and then that of course is going to speed up the hormonal process and those hormones attempt to keep your uh, your uh, your body and your attention elevated to deal with the threat, uh, you can only maintain that for so long because you are, you do have a finite amount of resources. You've only got so much energy uh, available uh, and you can only take in so much air at a time, uh, which you get the oxygen, which of course allows you to process the ATP uh, and then uh, excrete the CO2 and then the ATP allows you to actually use your muscles uh, and that's dependent upon uh, how much uh, resources you have uh, as far as uh, fats uh, and um, glucose go. But you can't maintain that for very long. So uh, as this is maintained, if the threat is not um, uh, handled, uh, you move to uh, two different versions for stage three. Uh, so technically stage three is where you have like resolution. So it's 
option number one, you um, uh, re return to normal, how would I phrase this one? Recover, there we go. You either uh, enter recovery, so uh, returns to homeostasis, Uh, and there, of course, would be mostly parasympathetic, where it's slowing it down. Your autonomic, your autonomic um, uh, nervous system is, is tuning it back. And I can actually begin here, but uh, we're going to assume you've, you've dealt with the, uh, the issue. So your body tries to return to a normal state. You've dealt with the threat or appraised it as not a threat, whatever it might be. Or the, uh, the more infamous of these options, or let's say you don't deal with the threat. It's, it's consistent. Or uh, you continue to appraise it as a threat, or you worry about it in the future, like it's, uh, it's like a form of distant uh, uh, stress, then uh, you're going to um, likely fall into this exhaustive stage. Uh, so in the exhaustive stage, is definitely where you don't want to be. Exhaustive stage. Right, this is where you have uh, depleted, completely depleted your um, uh, physiological or nutritional uh, and energy uh, resources. Uh, so you're, you're literally exhausted. Your body just doesn't have the uh, energy and resources to maintain this heightened state. Uh, it'd be like, uh, this isn't exactly the same thing, but imagine if you, uh, I mean, you can't sprint forever. You have to stop eventually because you don't have, like, even if you kept running and you used your uh, determination to just consciously override your body saying, oh, God, stop, it hurts, uh, you would eventually collapse because you would, at one point, completely uh, ex extinguish your body's ability uh, to keep running. Like, you, your legs would freeze up at some point. You would actually physically be forced to stop uh, against your own will even if you wanted to keep running. Uh, it's a similar scenario, uh, obviously not as extreme or as visible, but uh, you are draining your body's resources to the point that uh, they're having to divert them from other functions, which are going to be important, uh, like your immune system, maintaining that bodily repair, uh, which your immune system is involved in the early stages of. Uh, if you can't use them for that, then that's going to weaken those, those functions. So by constantly staying in this cycle uh, of, of this elevated state, because you, uh, again, are dealing with the, the stressor still, or you've You've still appraised it incorrectly uh, as a threat, and it's still causing anxiety uh, and a stress response. That's going to deplete you over time. Uh, and this is, by the way, why people who uh, are stressed more often than others uh, tend to have shorter lifespans. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the disorders they get attached to. Uh, they often have worse memory, and they often age quicker, too. Um, but let's talk real quick about the, the types. There's kind of a scale, by the way. Uh, of dealing with stress. So there's, there's a stress scale. I don't know what to call it other than there's a stress scale. Um, uh, as far as types, uh, there's like one, and all the way to five, obviously. Uh, one would be acute stress. So it's just, it's very quick. Whoop, it scared you, but then you realize it's not a big deal. Uh, and then there's, um, I don't remember all the stages because they're not that important if I name them correctly or not. Then there's like normal, something that pops up and you deal with it, no problem. Uh, then there'd be like an intermediate sort of uh, stress state where it pops up and it takes you a little while, but you do handle it and it, it eventually subsides and goes back and you go to recovery. Uh, but the uh, ones where it gets more worrisome, where you start uh, flirting with this uh, exhaustive state, are uh, the chronic portion of the scale, which means it's happening over and over and over constantly. Even if you somehow resolve it, it, it pops back up again, it's constantly happening to you. Or it never goes away because uh, you're experiencing distant uh, or distance th uh, stress where you're worried about something that might happen later. So here is the thing keeps coming up and you keep uh, having to deal, have this stress response, or you keep thinking about something that is going to happen in the future, hence the distance, it's not even there in the moment. Uh, that's going to uh, keep uh, re restarting or reinitiating this cycle. Uh, and this is how uh, certainly by four and five, you uh, start um, endangering yourself by exposing yourself to this exhaustive state. Exhaustive state. So how does that actually endanger you? Well, there's a bunch of disorders, uh, both um, psychological as well as uh, actual physical or physiological disorders uh, slash um, detriments. Detriments like the opposite of benefit. That benefit's a good thing for you, detriment's a bad thing for you, it damages you. Um, so, because you are constantly using up your body's resources uh, and overusing your um, autonomic system uh, as well as your uh, uh, endocrine system, you can uh, experience many different versions 
uh, or many different types. We're just going to focus on a few. So first of all, the constant use of an elevation of your heart rate uh, can cause you to be more prone to heart disease, which of course uh, almost always ends in uh, cardiac arrest, uh, whether it's a, a fatal heart attack or a non-fatal heart attack, uh, regardless. Um, hypertension, which is basically just high blood pressure, which often leads to or is associated with uh, heart disease, blood pressure. Um, you can also experience, uh, be more susceptible to headaches and migraines from the constant worry. Um, other examples are, oh, uh, this is making you much more uh, vulnerable to mood disorders, particularly depression, which we'll talk about in unit eight, or if you're in 2020, never, uh, unless you watch other videos or look it up on your own. Um, that's, uh, those are some debilitating uh, diseases and uh, life spanning or shortening and tend to shorten your lifespan. Uh, but also too, uh, it affects your memory, uh, worsened. Uh, it affects your hippocampus. Uh, it actually deteriorates it faster. So you're actually more likely to lose the ability to make new memories uh, going forward, or at least quicker than others. Um, it's gonna damage your cell structure. It makes you less able to uh, repair your cells properly. And, and that's why you see the aging uh, more frequently. Uh, so your immune system is gonna be compromised. And when I say that, I mean, uh, there's a, your immune system is incredibly complicated. There's a whole bunch of functions. I'd highly suggest, by the way, looking up uh, an explanation of the immune system by uh, a German, they speak in English, a German um, uh, production company or, or or presentation known as Kurzgesagt. I'll link it in the video about the immune system. Best video or series of videos I've seen about how it actually works. Does a wonderful job, far better job than I would ever do describing it. Uh, but your immune system is very complex. There are tons of different um, uh, cells and parts of it, and they all interact differently. They're very dependent on energy though and resources. So proteins and available energy to actually fight infections. Um, so whether it's uh, B cells or T cells or NK cells or any other types of cells, and they all do different things, whether it's communicating about uh, threats, uh, whether it's bacteria or pathogens or, or, or uh, 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 fungi, whatever it is, uh, or they are dealing with the destruction of like the consumption and, and dissolving of foreign bodies or cells that have uh, been infected by a virus or, or, or are cancerous. Uh, or it deals with antibody production, which uh, uh, mark uh, cells for destruction, uh, whether it's bad cells that are cancerous or have a virus uh, or a, a bacterial uh, cell, uh, or um, they uh, disable it from even working. Uh, all of those require a bunch of energy to do. So the less energy you're able to give to your immune system, because it's, it's constantly focused on uh, maintaining uh, this, this heightened state of stress uh, through energy and, and other resources, uh, the weaker your immune system is going to be. So that's going to mean several things. Uh, first of all, you're more susceptible to uh, uh, disease, uh, susceptible to diseases, just regular infections. More. So just standard lung infections, other illnesses, viruses, bacteria, whatever it might be. Uh, you have less resources and um, uh, your immune system is less able to respond to the threat, so you're more likely to get sick, stay sick longer, and, and, and suffer more from it. Uh, but it also, your immune system plays an important role in bodily repair. So bodily repair is gonna be slow. And you also just have less resources to uh, divert to bodily repair. Uh, and then uh, I already mentioned the memory uh, is gonna be compromised as well. Uh, oh, and uh, you're more prone to uh, cancer vulnerability. Because uh, your immune system is constantly killing cancer cells. Uh, you have cells, because you have trillions of cells, uh, and whenever they screw up in their coding, which happens, you know, every so every one and a half or many billion times, um, they are technically cancerous and they, they overproduce and they divert resources away from your body. Uh, but your immune system seeks them out and uh, destroys them. But if your immune system is weakened, uh, so there's less patrolling cells or they have less ability to uh, fight and kill off these cells as they reproduce, uh, you're more vulnerable uh, to certain types of cancer. So there's a whole bunch of negative um, um, health effects uh, that go along with it. There are a couple positives though. Um, when it's appropriate, this system is uh, fairly good at helping you uh, survive or do better uh, at whatever the threat is, so long as it's um, 
legitimate, first of all, but second of all, it's something you're, you're, you're somewhat familiar with or already good at. So this is actually what's known as the uh, Yerkes uh, Dodson curve. Uh, and has to do with uh, this physiological uh, arousal, specifically the presence of heightened uh, glucocorticoids slash autonomic. Uh, so you could classify it as emotional or stress, but we're talking about specifically for stress because that's how they tested it too. They would essentially uh, heighten their either glucocorticoids or uh, epinephrine levels uh, to see how people did. What they found was um, this stress response uh, and these, these hormones and this autonomic functioning actually uh, improved performance for simple or well-known uh, tasks. So, for example, if I got nervous uh, because there was a crowd watching me, that's called social facilitation, by the way. Uh, I might actually perform better if I'm already good at what I do. Like, let's say I already play basketball and uh, there's a big crowd. It's like a big game. I get nervous. I'll actually play a little better because uh, I already know what I'm doing. Or it's a simple task like solve a simple puzzle or, you know, uh, shoot a shot or whatever. If the task is simple or you already know it, you're familiar with it, um, this stress response actually enhances your uh, performance. So that's, that's a wonderful thing. However, and that's just a standard uh, linear curve, right? So if you have a graph here and this is like... Uh, how well you're doing. This is a zero. This is a hundred, like as good as you can possibly do it. Uh, and then down here would be the amount of these uh, glucocorticoids or, or physiological arousals. So we'll just say uh, glucocorticoids. Hundred being, I don't know, hundred per unit of volume. I don't know what. And then of course zero would be zero. Uh, the more glucocorticoids you have, and we'll use this to represent. The more glucocorticoids you have, the the better you actually perform. Uh, so when they're in a low amount, uh, they, they stay low, but as you increase the amount, uh, your performance goes up. So here's your performance, and here's your uh, uh, corticoid uh, number amount. That, that's standard. It's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Uh, that's only, though, if you already know the task or it's a simple one. If, however, it's a, a task you're, you're not sure of or you haven't done before, uh, you're not practiced at, or it's complex. So it's something that's not simple, you've got to figure it out. Uh, or uh, it's new, it's novel, like you're not familiar with it, you will actually perform worse after a certain point. So it, it forms kind of a weird um, uh, uh, bathtub curve. Uh, actually, the graph backwards, so it's going to be an upside down one, but that's fine. Uh, what it actually uh, found was a complex uh, or unknown slash novel tasks uh, performance decreases at a point. Uh, they've, actually found by the, they've actually found that, generally speaking, if it, the harder the task, the more complex it is, the more uh, unpredictable or unknown it is, the better off it is that you're relaxed. But if you already know how to do it and you're good at it, uh, that increased uh, elevation and, and increased energy is actually going to benefit you. But when you have to slow down and think and focus on it because you don't know it or it's difficult, um, then it, it actually hurts you. So the bell curve, or the curve looks more like this um, so it starts at a point where a low amount um, uh, makes your performance go pretty good. And you get a little, you get a little mini spike here uh, initially, but once it reaches a certain point, uh, then your performance actually is going to drop. I should use a different color for that if I was at all smart. There we go. Uh, so, oh, and then I made that in red. So this is going to be in blue. Ta da! already have that one. And now since I wrote this in red, uh, that'll be uh, the curve for the difficult or complex tasks. It looks a little bit more like this, and then it declines. Uh, so you kind of have like a, and I, I do this backwards, but it, you get the same idea. Uh, it makes like a bathtub curve because you do have a, a point where it helps uh, at the beginning, but uh, as soon as uh, uh, the task is difficult, increase the amount does not help you. It actually hurts you. So there's like a, a sweet spot uh, for uh, stimulation or arousal that you want. Uh, that's basically what your Dodson is. And you could throw it in at, at emotion if you wanted, or at stress. I think it's probably more appropriate for stress, though, uh, because it does help you in most cases. And if you're fighting or running, those are things that we generally, well, maybe not the fighting part, but certainly the running part we would, uh, we would be good at. Or if it's a simple task, uh, if we're already trained to fight, we'll, we'll do that technically better. But as soon as it becomes difficult or complex, uh, the uh, stress response is, or the arousal levels are actually going to make it worse or make us perform uh, worse. So... That's essentially the
the overview of actual uh, stress and, and how it works uh, physiologically uh, with your uh, nervous system and with your uh, endocrine system. Uh, the stage is a general adaptation uh, system, and then of course syndrome would be you're your stuck in one of these cycles because you're on the stress scale of chronic or, or distant stress. And that can actually uh, have detrimental effects on your body and mind. And then uh, don't forget also that uh, according to the yerkes dodson curve, uh, increased levels of arousal actually hurt your performance if it's complex or unknown. Uh, but if it's simple and you know it, it actually helps you out, which is great. You've got to run or, or fight for your life. Uh, so lastly, we'll focus on uh, how people can cope. So uh, it's more of a unit eight topic, but since we've established that uh, connection between emotion and appraisal through Lazarus, and then that, that uh, connection to your prefrontal cortex uh, by Lido, um, we know that awareness of, of, of stress and being able to appraise it and perceive it uh, correctly would be, uh, can actually help people, of course, overcome some of their anxiety uh, and fears and, and stress. So uh, coping, uh, before we even get to the, the couple specific types, we do know that um, appraisal, and, which is basically your perception, uh, can improve anxiety and fear. Right? And that's, that's Lazarus and his uh, discoveries. Uh, and we know that's possible through exposure therapy, which isn't uh, Ledoux's findings, but his discovery of that uh, secondary uh, communication network between the amygdala uh, and the brain, the, the conscious part of the brain, prefrontal cortex, uh, was um, uh, discovered by or, or theorized by uh, this connection. Uh, can help as well. Anxiety. All right, so you can literally just, uh, and exposure therapy is essentially, um, you know, you're constantly exposing yourself and realizing that this thing is not actually a threat, doesn't kill you, doesn't harm you. Uh, or you could have um, uh, some of the uh, rational emotive behavior therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy where you basically try to logically assess the situation uh, and figure out what your root fear is and why you should, why it's potentially not harmful to you uh, or why you're actually afraid of it and you can actually deal with the underlying issue that you're afraid of. But that's for another unit. So those are some uh, blanket ways, but more common ways people function and focus uh, and try to cope with stress without using any specific strategies uh, like uh, appraising the situation differently through a cognitive uh, behavioral therapy uh, or exposure therapy, that's behaviorism. Um, the uh, more common ones are two approaches. They're problem focused, coping, and that's just as simply as uh, they see the stressor as some sort of obstacle or unknown or threat, and so they figure out a way to overcome that obstacle or eliminate the threat, essentially. Uh, so if I'm worried about a test, problem-focused method would be, uh, all right, I'm scared or anxious about this test, I'm feeling stressful, so the best thing I do is just study for it so I'm not as stressed about it because I know I've prepared. Uh, and then you go through and you do better and yeah, you feel better and that makes you feel better about future tests as well. Uh, so that is uh, uh, fixing or addressing uh, the issue directly with a strategy uh, or uh, solution. So again, example, uh, stressed for test. Problem focused method would be, oh, I just study for the test. All right, um, if you're having some sort of stressful uh, relation with your, with your family member, because I know you're fighting or, or you're disagreeing with them or whatever, uh, the problem focused method would be uh, not to avoid it or, or even talk to others about it, maybe if you're seeking advice, but you just want to go and settle that thing immediately. Find that family member or person you're having the argument with or, or issues with and just talk it out directly and, and figure it out. So uh, a strained relationship, uh, you would just go and uh, talk it out directly. No beating around the bush, no talking to other people about it, just unless you're trying to figure it out, uh, just go right for it. Man, all my workers are running out. Um, the next one would be emotion-focused coping. I'm not sure I like the name here because it's not exactly what's going on in all the cases, but uh, this is where someone uh, looks to either distract, uh, ignore, 
the stressor, or um, seek, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Seek, not aid or count, support, there we go, or seek support. And I don't mean, by the way, somebody giving you a solution, uh, more like just sharing their experience and what's stressing them, uh, and then receiving some sort of uh, acknowledgement or feedback or empathy or sympathy, uh, and that would actually make them feel better. So it's almost like venting or talking it out, uh, and then they feel better about it, even if it didn't change the actual thing. It made them feel better about it, So um, or seek support. So example would be, um, uh, your, we'll use these examples here, uh, stressed for a test. Uh, one option would be, um, to either, well, we'll go with uh, the, the first part, distracting or ignoring, you would just literally uh, play video games. See friends, uh, do other activities, uh, and you'd just basically be uh, putting it off or ignoring it or distracting yourself from your negative emotions in that case. Uh, wouldn't suggest it, but certainly it could work to make you not sit there and worry about it. Um, or, more practically, would be the seeking support thing, which can work for some people. Wouldn't work for me at all, but um, it can. By the way, uh, this tends to be a more popular tactic for men. This tends to be a more popular tactic uh, for women. Not necessarily this part, but the second one I'm going to talk about here, the, the seeking support. Uh, but it's not gendered per se. Uh, by majority it is, for on average, but any individual, uh, male or female, can go either route. Just so happens more men tend to go this route, more women tend to go this route. Uh, so yeah, and uh, one of the complaints I've, I've always heard um, when I was younger, certainly, and I've heard just in general, is uh, like uh, a wife or girlfriend will complain to their boyfriend or husband about something. Uh, when they're looking just for some sort of acknowledgement or, or support or empathy, and then the, the boyfriend or husband like offers like, oh, you should do this instead, like a solution, because that's what, that's how uh, they see, um, that's how they cope with the, the stressors, uh, and of course that's not at all what they're looking for in this case. But again, that doesn't mean females have to do this and, and males have to do that. Uh, you can vary, we're just talking averages. Uh, so, um, strained relationship, like let's say they're having a fight with their spouse or uh, they're frustrated with their kids or, or, or whatever it might be, or their boss, uh, rather than deal with it directly necessarily, uh, and maybe they will eventually, but they would um, seek some sort of, uh, seek empathy or sympathy uh, or uh, acknowledgement from a friend or counselor, fan member, counselor. Almost like, uh, you know, venting, essentially, about it. Uh, and that can make people feel better. That actually, for me, makes it worse. That just, like, like stirs the pot for me and, and makes me more uh, upset about whatever it is. Um, usually, mine manifests as anger. Uh, but that's what a, um, that's a possibility, and some people that works very well for. Uh, and this one actually frustrates them instead um, uh, or makes them feel unsatisfied with, uh, with the result. So those are the basic two basic uh, coping mechanisms that people use, but again, you can also use the technical ones like reappraising it with cognitive behavioral ther therapy or exposure therapy. But that's a unit eight topic for clinical psychology. Very last thing, um, people can be more or less resistant to stress naturally, and that could be a, a temperamental thing, a personality thing uh, regarding people's emotional stability. So they could be just not sensitive to negative emotion at all, and then which is low neuroticism, and then they're not really stressed uh, at all in the first place. Uh, or maybe they have moderate uh, neuroticism, but they're really extroverted, so they have a lot of positive emotion, uh, and they don't really experience the negative as much as the positive, uh, which, which dominates them. But usually, people that are low in neuroticism don't get stressed much. Uh, even if they are, it's just temporary, and, and it goes away quickly. But uh, you can actually uh, enhance your own uh, resistance. So uh, I'll say um, uh, personal uh, resistance to stress. And that can uh, that has a lot to do with your perspective. I don't mean your appraisal, by the way. I mean your perspective about how much agency you have, so how much ability you have to affect change or to make things right or to eliminate the stress. So we're focusing on what's called the locus of control. I'll say individual control, but that's implied. Uh, locus is basically just the point uh, and I don't mean like to point them, I mean like the point from which it occurs. Um, so it would be like a, like a, like a tether, essentially. Uh, so if you had a ball, you guys remember those, uh, you ever play, um, crap, what do you call it? Did you call it tetherball? 
I can't remember what it's called. Um, maybe it was called tether ball, but like the, we have the pole and then there's the ball that's on a string and you like hit it around and it goes around. Uh, there, the, the locus or the point would be where the ball's tied on to the, to the pole. That's the point of uh, connection. So uh, this, this one has to do with the, uh, the point of uh, personal or individual control. So this basically means who do you think has the most impact on your life? You or the outside world? So you have an, uh, those that um, are less resistant to stress, so more resistant to stress. Actually, let, list them out first. You have the external locus of control. So they think that the point of control, uh, the, I don't know, the, the control board or whatever, the thing that affects your life and affects how you feel uh, is largely external. So other people or other phenomena, whether it's God or universe or whatever it might be, or gods or uh, I don't know, some complex uh, understanding of nature or whatever it might be, uh, they or other people right in their lives they have more control over, over the individual uh, in their life. So if they're uh, feeling down or they feel like they are not successful or they're poor or whatever, or they're sick, they don't think that, um, they don't believe they have a whole lot of power to make their situation better. They think that others are uh, keeping them down. Or if they're feeling happy, they think that others are allowing them to feel uh, good or, or, or helping them feel good. So this is the uh, belief, our fate, uh, or uh, life is largely, or at least more so, um, a result of external forces. And that could be a spiritual thing, like uh, a belief in, in God, capital G or lower G, uh, nature, uh, the universe, uh, spirits, or uh, practically uh, uh, other people or institutions. Um, are, are most so in control of, of your own fate. So your living situation uh, is mostly determined by uh, others or other forces. Uh, and these, uh, this group is uh, far more susceptible to uh, stress, first of all, stress uh, and other mood disorders and well, almost all psychological disorders. Uh, these people tend to uh, have shorter lifespans. They tend to be less happy uh, and less successful and successful as defined by the person, like how fulfilled and happy they are and uh, whether it's socioeconomically or whatever. Uh, they tend to do worse in every marker. The group that tends to do far better and is far more resistant to stress and, def and tends to, uh, on average, have a far more fulfilling uh, and successful life uh, according to their own terms, uh, is uh, people that have an internal locus of uh, control perspective. So that's the opposite of external, right? They believe that the point of control is largely within them. They are the ones that largely de determine their fate. They're not stupid enough to think that they have no control or that they have all control, uh, just like I'm sure most external locusts aren't stupid enough to think that they have no control whatsoever. But the degree to control that they think they have of their own lives compared to people that would be on this end of the spectrum is much higher. Um, they believe that if they're sick or they're, they've had bad luck or they're successful or not successful or poor or rich, it's largely because of, of their own efforts. Again, not specifically solely them, but they have the most impact on their own life um, compared to other factors. So uh, the belief, our fate, and life uh, is largely a result of uh, personal or internal factors. So they're much less likely to uh, uh, look to others for a solution or wait for things to happen. They're much more likely to make them happen themselves, or at least believe that's the correct route. Uh, so they're much more uh, proactive so they look to avoid or, or, or better things in the future. Uh, they don't react to things uh, more like the external group would. Uh, so they're more proactive, involved, um, and um, accountable, I guess you could say, in their own lives. And they are uh, the opposite as well. They are far more resistant to stress psychological disorders 
um, and they enjoy a, a longer, uh, more fulfilled lives. Uh, and they find that out too, by the way. And, and, and I must say, uh, while this group is, if you believe that no outside factors have anything to do with it, even if you're not uh, religious, it's very clear that the outside world has some impact uh, on your life and your predicament. Uh, but you would do yourself a large favor by reorienting your thought to, okay, fair enough, there are some things out of my control, but uh, I have a large amount of impact on my own life. So if something about my life is not ideal that I don't like, I shouldn't blame others necessarily um, or exclusively, because uh, again, you can always correctly blame something on the outside, um, external forces. But I, I'm much more, it's much more practical and realistic um, or um, effective for me to try to change things on my own, even if I can't uh, to the degree that I want to. Uh, just you pursuing uh, your own, uh, just you attempting to make your life better on your own terms through your own uh, will, will make you feel better regardless. And it will almost certainly also make your life objectively better, or at least subjectively better to yourself uh, by your own standards. So if you want to be, um, if you want more success in life, whether that's with relationships or career or whatever it is, whatever by your own standards, you accepting that uh, while there are other forces, you have the most impact or at least a large impact and pursuing that, it's gonna make your life better uh, psychologically as far as your perspective goes and perception, but also generally speaking, it also just makes your life better in general because you tend to get more of the things you want than if you were to wait around uh, for them to happen or, or befall you uh, or blame others for what doesn't go right. So. That is the uh, section on uh, stress and coping, uh, and then the next sections will be on personality theories uh, and measuring.